Hello, this is lecture two, chapter two, transmission lines wave equations. In the first lecture, we considered a transmission line, a pair of conductors, source at one end and a load at another end, and supposedly we are sending a signal from the source to the load. And we would like to get a full understanding of what happens as a result of this communication media or transmission media that connects the source to the load here. So we looked at the transmission line as a pair of conductors and we produced a physically based model of distributed resistance, distributed inductance, distributed resistance, distributed capacitance and we started writing the differential equation that describes the voltage and current on the line at different locations. And to do that, what we've done was to take an increment, look closely at the increment, delta R, delta L, delta G, delta C, and looked at the voltage and current at one end of the increment in terms of the voltage and current of the uh, other increment. And that ended up to be a difference equation. We took the limit as delta Z goes to zero. We end up with a differential equation. The equations that we uh, found and the solution for those equation was basically V of Z is equal to V plus e to the minus gamma Z plus V minus e to the plus gamma Z where gamma was a square root of R plus J omega L times G plus J omega C. The current equation was in the form of 1 over Z naught times a similar equation except we have a minus sign here instead of a plus and the Z naught was basically given by a square root of the ratio. We express gamma as real and imaginary, so we express also Z naught as real and imaginary. This solution here, all right, had lots of things here that we need to understand and relate to. V plus, for example, V minus, these are arbitrary constants. Whenever you solve a differential equation, you end up with some constants. Well, gamma, well, these are not arbitrary now. This is simply related to the physical model of the transmission line. The R, L, C, and G, and the frequency. Z naught, again, it's a physical parameter that relates to R, L, G, and C, and the frequency. So we want to see the physical implication of these parameters here, as well as what these constants are all about. So that's what this lecture is about. Uh, it's important to recognize that this is basically a frequency domain solution. It's very obvious. We're using uppercase V and we have a J omega, uppercase I, and we have a J omega here as well. These expressions are all in the frequency domain. That was the right column of the table that we did last lecture in lecture one, where we did the time domain solution on the left hand side and the frequency domain solution on the right hand side. Well, as you recall in chapter one, we discussed how important it is to get back to the time domain to be able to relate to the physical model or the physical insight of what's happening here. So here was the time domain solution. If you recall again from last chapter, equation 29 and 30, here they are. That's the time domain solution. V of Z and T, lowercase now, is equal to the same V plus that we have here, but now is a magnitude. That's not a complex number anymore e to the minus alpha z cosine omega t minus beta z plus some phase and the v minus term have e to the plus alpha z alpha being the real part of the gamma here gamma is equal to alpha plus j beta all right so e to the plus alpha z cosine omega t plus beta z again plus because you have a plus here versus a minus here and you have a phase that corresponds to the v minus the i is likewise uh, magnitude of v plus over z naught similar expression so these are the time domain expressions that will hopefully explain to us what's going on now if we take the case of a lossless line where the internal resistance r is equal to zero and the internal conductance g is equal to zero no losses no resistance no conductance only inductance and capacitance. The expression for gamma, if you go back here and put R is equal to zero and put G is equal to zero, you get J omega L times J omega. Here it is. All right. Gamma becomes pure imaginary. No more alpha. Alpha is zero. And you have gamma is equal to J omega square root of LC. 
and z naught is real square root of l over c no more j's if you look recall here z naught had a j in it all right well z naught here is pure real the reactance here is gone all right so that is your um, answer or these are your parameters in the lossless case the V plus is equal to V plus e to the minus J beta Z and V minus e to the plus J beta Z and the I likewise. If we look at the time domain now, look at this. This e to the minus alpha Z is gone. So we have that V plus, there it is, cosine omega T minus beta plus V minus e to the plus alpha Z is gone, it's only cosine. All right. So that all was done last lecture we are putting it here back as a review all right let's go to the physical implication and i'm going to start by looking at this expression right here the equation 29 right there this equation okay this equation right here okay here it is again okay now let's plot that versus position and time it is functional position function of time to do that, we are going to do it in two steps. I'm going to look only at the left-hand side uh, term, this term only. All right. So assume that this term here, for some reason, is put aside for the time being. If you consider this term alone, you see a constant here, and there is a cosine function there. Right. So here it is, a cosine function, and the amplitude of the cosine function is decaying at some attenuation rate here. The envelope of that is e to the minus alpha z. Here is the envelope e to the minus alpha z that attenuates the cosine function. The cosine function itself has omega t minus beta z. That means it's a function of both position and time. If I plot it here versus position, that means this cosine function is going to change as t changes. So if I start with the dark one at t is equal to zero, the grayer line here is a t uh, equal for example delta t as time goes on the shape of the wave all right goes to the right and shifts versus position so basically this term right here the v plus term represents a cosine wave or a sinusoid if you wish that is moving to the right in other words a traveling wave all right moving in the positive z direction this way and that's actually why you, you recall we had these names v plus and v minus and we never told you why well here's the first time you are seeing the reason for that v plus that v plus right here is an indication of a traveling wave traveling in the plus z direction or the positive z direction from the source to the load direction all right now this wave as it travels it decays it's going at a certain attenuation right here e to the minus alpha z the amplitude is decaying all right and that alpha was related to if you go back to the equation here where is alpha alpha is right there okay is real part of this expression here and it's related to r sub z l g and c and when r would and g were zeros right here okay alpha was zero alpha disappeared that means alpha is coming as a result of this r and g it's related to all that, yes, but R and G are the prime elements that cause this attenuation to take place. Basically, the losses in the internal resistance and the internal conductance of the transmission line make the wave lose amplitude. All right. So that's the uh, attenuation coefficient alpha. All right. And we express that here, if you wish, if you read that part here, it talks about an attenuation coefficient of e to the minus alpha z. All right. Now, um, wh wh where is the wavelength? The wavelength, I'm going to use a different color to show the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between two locations of the same phase. These are two locations of the same phase, right here. All right. I chose the intercept of the darkest line and the z-axis between this point and that point. That distance here is what we call the wavelength, because the wavelength, by definition, is the distance over which the wave repeats itself again. That wavelength corresponds to a change in phase by 2 pi. All right. If the distance here is lambda, that means beta times lambda is equal to 2 pi. And we're writing that down here. 
and from which you discover that lambda is equal to 2 pi over beta. What was beta again? Let's go back and see what beta again. Beta was the imaginary part of gamma, which again relates to R, L, G, and C. And in the lossless case, beta was simply related to L and C. So L and C are the dominant ones or the prime ones for producing the beta, and R and G are the dominant ones that produce the alpha. All right? We'll see later that the expressions are a bit more complicated than that. We are just putting uh, a simple physical insight into what these terms come from. So the wave propagation comes from the LNC and the wave attenuation comes from the alpha, which is the RNG. So how fast does the wave travel? All right, again, we want to see how fast. That means how much distance does the phase um, travel uh, over a certain amount of time. So if we, if we do that and we express uh, the change in delta Z in terms of a change in delta T, you end up with this expression here, omega delta T is equal to beta delta Z, from which delta Z over delta T is equal to the phase velocity, which ends up to be omega over beta. Uh, further development, we can see that C phase is equal to length time F's which is uh, a famous expression you must have seen in earlier coursework. Now, if I go back to this expression again, and write it in terms of some of this new notation that we have here, we can rewrite it as V of Z and T is equal to E to the minus alpha the attenuation cosine omega T minus Z over phase velocity plus that phase and that. Okay, This expression here means that our wave as position goes on, there is a time shift. You can see that right here. And that delay in time is equal distance over the phase velocity. So as time goes on, we expect that position is going to change. There will be further delay, all right? And obviously further attenuation. Now, the other equation here on the right-hand side is uh, a similar story, except for the polarity here now minus and plus, uh, V plus, we call it V minus, E to the minus alpha Z, we call this E to the plus alpha Z. What's going on here is basically, if we consider this transmission line and look at it in general, we have not applied the boundary conditions yet. What we have here now is just a transmission line. We never really talked about the source or the load. And we'll solve the equation for that. And not knowing what's going to happen at the boundaries, in general, we can say that there could be very well a propagation in both directions. Who said that the wave is going to go from left to right? You know, unless you really determine that there is a source here and a load here. In general, without applying boundary conditions, you can have either of the two solutions. You can have the wave from left to right and the right to left. And that's why the general equation that we have here is talking about the two possible solutions the V plus which travels the positive Z direction and the V minus that would travel in the negative Z direction. And obviously because Z will go in the opposite direction, the polarity obviously is going to change. And that makes sense because E to the plus alpha Z, if we look at that here, there it is. That's a wave traveling in the opposite direction. Okay? The, the attenuation in this direction now, okay? If you look at this attenuation in this direction, Relative to this axis here, it's e to the plus alpha z. All right? It looks like an increase because the origin is on the left, while the propagation coming from right to left. So that propagation is still an attenuation. Relative to that, it gets written as e to the plus alpha z, as we saw in the expression here, e to the plus alpha z. All right? And the phase shift now is plus. And that plus z over so is delay. This way again, because we are going in the opposite direction. So with the two happening simultaneously, that's what you have. So we have two waves. A wave that travels from left to right in the positive z direction and attenuates this way. All right. And the other wave, which is possibly, can occur at the same time that travels from right to left in the opposite direction 
and attenuates this way. All right. These are basically the two waves that we expressed here in our expression when we said a V plus e to the minus alpha z. There it is. Remember that? And a V minus e to the plus alpha z. All right. When you look at the V plus, that's a positive traveling wave and the V minus was the negative traveling wave. So we're able to see that through going back to the time domain where we can examine the physical insight of what's going on. We understand what the alpha and the beta are about. The alpha is about the attenuation and the beta is about the wavelength and the phase velocity, the propagation characteristics on the transmission line. Now, if we go back to the lossless case, remember the lossless case? Here it is. R is equal to zero and G is equal to zero. The expression here, alpha and was zero, beta was related to L and C, Z naught was real, the expressions were here, the time domain here, here, no attenuation. There's no e to the minus alpha Z, there's no e to the plus alpha Z. We have still the cosine functions, but no attenuation. So all these shapes here will have no attenuation in this case, and that's basically what's going to happen here. All right? You have unattenuated wave that travels from left to right. That would be the green one right there. Okay. And a wave traveling in the negative z direction in the opposite direction. All right. So now, the, how we determine v plus and v minus? How much of this wave and how much of that wave? That's going to be decided by what goes on at the ends here. It's just like, a, you know, you paved a new road, all right? And you are waiting now for traffic to start. And obviously, that will de de be determined about how many cars coming from this direction, how many cars coming from that direction. You may have all cars coming from one direction only, or the other direction only, or both. And that's the same exact situation that you will have here. How much of a source sent signal, how much of a, a signal coming from the opposite direction. Now, someone would say, well, I only have a load here, so there is nothing coming back. Well, there could be some dead end here and tra cars would travel back. You know, that may not be a source of cars. It may be some of the cars that went this way came back. So it doesn't require another source on this end to send the signal back. It could be a situation happening here that caused some of the signal that was sent here come back this way, and therefore you still have a V plus and a V minus. Now let's talk about the expressions for gamma Z naught V plus and V minus. Okay. Now go back to gamma alpha plus J beta, and that's the general expression that we have here. That's in the frequency domain. Remember alpha and beta are physical quantities as we saw them in the time domain, but they are in the frequency domain in a complex expression here that forms the gamma. If alpha explains the amplitude attenuation and beta explains the phase propagation, then gamma can be simply called the complex propagation constant. And, and by the way, alpha being the attenuation per unit length or per meter is measured in nepers per meter. And the one nepper is 8.686 decibels. And beta is measured in radians per meter. That's the phase uh, per unit length. Now that we have used the time domain to be able to get some physical insight of the parameters alpha, beta, and some about V plus and V minus, let's go back and look at the frequency domain expressions. As you can see, these expressions here summarize the transmission line behavior in two parameters, the gamma right there and the Z naught. The V plus and V minus are related to the boundary conditions as we said, but gamma and Z naught basically describe the transmission line. And here it is. If you look closely here, the Z naught is R, L, G, C and the frequency. Gamma is R, L, G, C and the frequency. So basically the transmission line model at a given frequency is summarized by gamma and Z naught. Gamma and Z naught fully characterize the transmission line at a given frequency. Obviously, if I give you gamma as a function of frequency and Z naught as a function of frequency, that means I basically told you all what you need to know about this transmission line. 
I don't need to give you R, L, G, and C anymore. And vice versa. If I give you R, L, G, and C, and uh, you need to analyze this transmission line, you can basically get your gamma and Z naught, and therefore you can discover uh, these equations and work with them. Gamma and Z naught. These are characteristic numbers for a given transmission line. For example, if we have uh, a cable, like the cable TV, for example, it's known to be a 75 ohm impedance cable. Um, when, you, when you look at the 75 ohms, that's basically the square root of the inductance per unit meter divided by the capacitance per unit meter of that cable. It doesn't refer to the R or the G of the cable. It refers actually to the ratio between its L and C. When you think about 75 ohms as a real number, you think that there is some 75 ohm inside that cable somewhere. Well, no. Basically, that's nothing but the ratio of L over C uh, the distributed inductance and distributed capacitance. Z naught is called the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, just like gamma was called a characteristic complex propagation constant of the transmission line. Now let's talk about the V plus and V minus. These two are bit constants that we put there. That means we have to really talk this time about the source end and the load end and what they do to the terminals of the line. At the source end, z is equal to zero, and our expression v of z and i of z will be in the form of v of zero and i of zero. At the load end, z is equal to l, and the voltage and current here are going to be called v of l and i of l. So we go back to the expressions of frequency domain and substitute these two special locations here, the z is equal to zero and z is equal to l. In the first equation here, here it is. Put z is equal to zero, you end up with v plus alone and v minus alone. So v of 0 as z is equal to 0 is equal to v plus plus v minus. And v of l is equal to what? Look at this now. v plus e to the minus gamma l plus v minus e to the plus gamma l. Here it is. Now if I look at the kvl around this loop here, this voltage v of 0 is equal to vs minus i of 0 times zs. Vs minus I of 0 times Zs. At the load end, V of L is equal to IL times ZL. VL is equal to IL times ZL. If I play the game and reduce all these equations together, I can solve these equations here. Simultaneously, I can get V plus and V minus. As you can see, it's very obvious that V plus and V minus depend on how much Vs is, which is the source. This source here is going to determine how much signal is traveling down the line, actually in both directions, because it's the only source in the circuit. Z dot is the characteristic impedance of the line. That's the property of the line, R, L, G, and C, and the frequency. Zs is the impedance of the source. That's also a factor. Zl is also a factor. And look at this, look at V minus. V minus again depends on V plus, which depends on all that, and the load, the properties of the line, Z naught and gamma. That is the amount of signal, as you can see, that comes back this way. It's a portion of V plus. That's how much is being reflected back from the load end. So that means the signal goes this way, and reflects and comes back here and guess what we will have in fact multiple reflections on the line physically in the time domain in the frequency domain we simply express them as two terms only waves to the right and waves to the left waves to the right are the waves traveling in the positive z waves to the left traveling in the negative z we are going to look at that more closely in the next lecture where we look at the multiple reflections that happen on the transmission line traveling waves standing waves and all that We'll see you next lecture.